Hello and welcome back to The Williamite Wars in Ireland, the third and final part of my series on post-Restoration Ireland. When I left off back in 2020, I had just covered the notorious Battle of the Boyne, a military disaster for the Jacobite forces and a brilliant victory for the forces of William. I mentioned last time that though the Williamites had won a major victory, the war was by no means over, and I was not exaggerating, as you'll soon see. Despite routing the Jacobite army at the Boyne, William's forces still had plenty of work to do. After the battle, the largely intact Jacobite army filtered back to the city of Limerick. It is estimated that some 20,000 men made it back to the city alive, although probably not all in fighting shape. Limerick itself was not an ideal location to defend. In centuries past, its defences would have been more than suitable to resist a siege, but with the advent of gunpowder technology, the city's medieval walls were rendered much less useful. The Jacobite commanders were no doubt aware of their positions as advantages, but nevertheless, by the end of July, most of the army was in residence there. The large French contingent of James's army made it back to Limerick with everyone else, under the command of an officer named Lauzun. This Lauzun asserted that Limerick was totally indefensible, and that the army should move to a better location. The Irish commanders disagreed with Lauzun's assessment, and a short argument ensued, leading to the French contingent leaving Limerick and making their way to Galway. The Irish troops decided to stay on in Limerick, nominally under the command of a French officer, but it was Patrick Sarsfield who held the true loyalty of the troops. There was nothing to do now but prepare for the siege, which was sure to come. Lauzen had not been wrong about the sorry state of the defences, and priority one was to repair gaps in the wall with fresh stonework, and lay provisions within the walls that could sustain the garrison for what could turn out to be a quite lengthy stay. The construction work was sped up by the enthusiastic aid of the local population, who still harboured much goodwill towards the Jacobite cause. For those of you unfamiliar with the place, Limerick is built upon an island in the middle of the River Shannon. This was definitely a boon to the defenders, as it meant that the walls were only accessible by bridge. Limerick's bridges at this time were protected by old but strong forts, though ultimately these would prove to be of little use to the defenders of the city. It was well for the defenders that they started preparing early, because William's army arrived before the walls in the second week of August. The Williamite commanders were eager to capitalise on the initiative they had gained through their victory at the Boyne, and seizing a major Jacobite stronghold like Limerick would be a surefire way to maintain that initiative. William's forces demonstrated their motivated state immediately, by capturing one of the bridge forts in sudden assault. Their foothold secured, William's army surrounded the city and settled down. William's position was strong, but he still lacked the heavy artillery that would be necessary to breach Limerick's walls, old though they were. Large cannons are difficult to move around, particularly when you can't rely on good roads to take you to your destination. As a result of this, William's siege train had lagged behind his main force, with only the light guns arriving alongside the infantry and cavalry. The defenders of Limerick would have noticed more or less immediately how ineffectual the enemy bombardment was. The big guns were clearly absent, so where were they? Patrick Sarsfield, who I mentioned earlier, received a lucky break at this point. Conflicting reports state that either a captured prisoner or a deserter from William's side tipped the defenders off about the location of the enemy siege train. They learned that the guns were on their way up the road from Cashel, and were at that moment camped at the crossroads of Ballyniti. This was an opportunity Sarsfield could not pass up. Wasting no time, a small portion of the garrison slipped out of Limerick and made their way to Ballyniti. The artillery crew were evidently not expecting to be attacked, because Sarsfield's men managed to disable every gun with scarcely a man lost on their side. In no time at all, the raiders made their way back to Limerick and got back over the walls, and it was at this point that things really started to turn against William. Despite the loss of this essential and very expensive equipment, William persevered with the siege. He was not about to give up on taking the city where most of the army that opposed him was living. His decision to stay was no doubt influenced by the fact that his engineers managed to salvage two of the guns, but even with this good luck, progress against the walls of Limerick was painfully slow. The city was fully blockaded at least, and the defenders would surely run out of food soon enough. Unfortunately for William, the surrender he was hoping for stubbornly refused to come. It was around this time that the weather started worsening. 
and even more worrying for the besiegers, the river was rising. If the Shannon continued to rise, William's camp would soon be a swamp. William knew that given the chance, the harsh Irish weather would decimate his forces, as it had Schomburgs the previous year. This left only one option for the besiegers, an all-or-nothing assault on the walls before the rising water levels rendered their position untenable. On the 27th of August, William sent a picked group of soldiers to storm a partly made breach in the walls. This picked force was followed up by a significant portion of the army to lend the assault the sort of irresistible momentum that it would need to break through the imperfect breach. What followed was a bloody melee in the mould of the siege of Londonderry. Like that siege, the women of Limerick are also said to have turned out in defence of their homes. Seeing his troops streaming back towards the camp in defeat, and worried at the encroaching river in bad weather, William at last lifted the siege. He himself was soon on his way back to England, delegating the rest of the war to his trusted commanders. Much like the Boyne, the successful defence of Limerick, while impressive, did not prove decisive. In fact, soon after William left for England, Lord Marlborough captured both Cork and Kinsale. To compound the situation, Lausen and his French troops in Galway decided to sail home, which must have been a huge blow to Jacobite morale. Some French officers would stay on in Ireland, but the Jacobites would see no more French regiments come to help them. The Siege of Limerick marked the end of the campaigning season for that year, and both sides sought out winter quarters. The island was now more or less split down the middle. William controlled most of the land east of the Shannon, while those loyal to James held sway in much of the west. Overall command of both sides was now delegated to generals rather than kings. On the Williamite side, a Dutchman by the name of Ginkle commanded his king's troops in Ireland. Meanwhile, the Jacobites received a new French commander named St. Ruth, who had been sent from Versailles. St. Ruth and Patrick Sarsfield were both professional soldiers, but they seemed to have had their differences about how the war should be fought. When Ginkle attacked Athlone in June 1691, the two came into conflict about how best to respond. St. Ruth was especially stung by the eventual capitulation of the town, as he had been nearby when the last of the forts fell. The French general favoured bringing on a battle with the Williamites following the defeat at Athlone, in an attempt to recapture the initiative. Sarsfield was opposed to this idea, stating that it was a needless risk, especially when one considered how the last major battle of the war had gone for the Jacobites. Sarsfield was overruled, and St. Ruth mobilised the army to meet the Williamites at a position of strength near the Valley of the Suck. The left of the Irish line was pressed up against the ruined castle of Ockram, from which the coming battle takes its name. St. Ruth went to great lengths to motivate his troops, riding up and down the line, exhorting the men to fight for the faith. Catholic priests are also said to have walked the lines bearing crosses. Ginkle and his army reached the assembled Jacobites on the 12th of July. His army numbered around 20,000 men, while the forces arrayed against him numbered 25,000. This numerical advantage, while of course useful to the Jacobites, was not so overpowering as it might seem to us. The thing that made Ginkle hesitant to attack right away was not the Jacobite numbers, but rather the strength of their position. St. Ruth was a veteran commander, and was no doubt well aware of the poorer quality of the troops at his command. The perfect way to offset this disadvantage was to choose an easily defensible position. Ginkle recognised this at once, and worried about the risk of attacking the enemy on ground they had chosen. Ultimately, however, whether he was pressured by his officers or pushed by necessity, Ginkle elected to attack that evening at five o'clock. The opening push at the Jacobite right must have confirmed Ginkle's fears about the battle. His troops floundered in the marshy ground and were unable to make progress against the Jacobite position. Shifting his focus left following this failure, Ginkle ordered another assault, this time on the enemy's centre. This too failed, as the Williamite troops were once again hindered by the difficult ground, as well as the makeshift barricade that had been erected in the Jacobite centre. At this point, Ginkle must have been considering retreat following two failed attacks for little to no gain. Determined not to give up until all options had been exhausted, however, the Williamite commander committed to one last assault on the enemy left flank, where the line was pressed up against the side of Ockram Castle. It was at this inopportune moment that St. Ruth was suddenly killed, presumably by a stray musket ball, 
command of the Jacobite forces would now have devolved onto Sarsfield, who had no idea that the general had just been killed. In addition to this communication failure, Sarsfield was under strict orders not to commit the reserve troops unless expressly ordered to do so. The Jacobite left was without much needed reinforcements, as the line began to buckle. With the command structure fractured, the Jacobite army began to give way little by little. A rout did not ensue immediately, as Sarsfield shepherded the army back in a fighting retreat, but eventually order began to break down and the army shattered, filtering back once again to places of strength in the west of the island. Unlike in the aftermath of the Boyne, the Williamites capitalised on their victory with great effect. Many towns in Munster and Connacht capitulated to the pressure of the advancing army and opened their gates. Before long, only Limerick still held out for James. The second siege of Limerick was approached much more carefully by the Williamite forces. Ginkle had plenty of time to examine the mistakes made by William in the previous attempt on the city, and acted with extreme caution. Such was Ginkle's caution, he did not venture any assault on any part of the defences until a month into the siege. He then focused his attention on one of the forts guarding the bridge into the city and took it by assault. The siege continued with few other major assaults until the defenders finally decided that further resistance was pointless. It fell to Patrick Sarsfield to negotiate terms for the surrender of the city, and on the 3rd of October 1691, Limerick was handed over in exchange for several terms. The settlement became known to us today as the Treaty of Limerick, and it had several conditions. The first of the terms was a military one. Irish soldiers who had fought on behalf of James during the war were to be permitted to enlist in the armies of France. For William, this had the useful outcome of removing several thousand angry former soldiers from his territory, thus removing a possible source of unrest. For the soldiers themselves, it gave them an opportunity to perhaps strike a blow at England in the future as the French and English were not on friendly terms. This first condition of the treaty was respected in latter times, but the following, and arguably more important condition, was not. One of the articles of the treaty stated that Irish Catholics should have such privileges in the exercise of their religion as were consistent with the laws of Ireland, or as they did enjoy in the reign of Charles II. This was a tremendously important concession as many of James's troops had supported him specifically to protect their right to religious freedom. An additional article, which was just as important, was an amnesty for those Jacobites who had fought against William and the restoration of their estates, should they make a formal submission to the new government. It is estimated that this article would have saved the estates of more than 3,000 landowners. While the right to enlist in French armies was upheld in latter times, the articles regarding religious freedom and freedom from land confiscation were either sidestepped or flat out ignored by the English government in the coming century, as the Protestant ascendancy got into full swing once more. This brings my series on post-restoration Ireland to a close. It's definitely been a rocky road for Ireland since the Stuarts returned to power in England. If you have any questions about this video, then feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at keyandrowanyt at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.